you will go ahead and turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and the title of the message today is Turning the Tide. Turning the Tide. In the book of Exodus, I'm going to kind of take you back, and you don't need to turn there, but I just want to tell you what happens. Over in the book of Exodus chapter 17, there's an event that takes place where Moses tells Joshua to go and fight against Amalek. And what happens is, is that when they go to fight, or Joshua's there fighting, as long as Moses' arms were raised, the, the children of Israel would prevail, and they'd win. But Moses got tired, and when his arms went down, they began to lose. And so in order to turn the tide of that particular battle, a man named um, Hur and a guy named Aaron came up, and they got to Moses situated where he could sit, and they would hold up Moses' arms. So as they held up his arms, then it turned the tide of the battle, and then Joshua's men uh, won that battle. And so today, in these verses, Paul is telling the church how to turn the tide and what needs to take place. If you look at verse 1, we're going to go, use, go down from 1 to 2 and 3. It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Sintiki, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Kamlint also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. And so the first thing that we see here in verse 1 is, is that he gives them a standfast challenge. What seems to be happening is that the church in Philippi, the Christians there, were having a tendency to kind of to, to fall back or to yield to the pressure of that time or yield to the sinfulness in that time. And so Paul begins to address that. It seems like it happens periodically, but they were prone to have spiritual retreat. And so Paul begins to, to, to speak to that issue because they were in a pagan city. And, in, and even in our today's time, as we uh, see our society becoming more sinful by the day or by the minute, uh, we really, really need to be, this needs to be addressed as we live our Christian life. And so how, does, how do we turn the tide? Or what needs to happen uh, in our life to turn the tide? And what does Paul say to them? He tells them to stand fast in the Lord. So he gives them the manner of which and how they need to stand, to stand fast in the Lord. And that word stand fast is from a, a Greek word. It means it's, it's stako. And it means that you stand firm in the Lord. And it, it's got to, that you are persist or you persevere standing there. But it also indicates, in this in the present tense, and so the tense of the verb is given the idea that you continuously do that. It's not something that you just do every now and then. It's not something that, you know, well, I stood good today and I'm going to fall tomorrow. No, the Word of God is telling you that you and I need to, to stand firm in the Lord. We'll get on to that a little bit more in a minute. So, but, see, you are a Christian soldier. And this Word leans itself to a, like a soldier uh, standing firm as the onslaught of the enemy comes, that they are standing firm no matter how the enemy attacks them, they're standing still. And we do realize and know that the devil will always come after us. The Bible says to, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Um, and so you know that the devil's always scheming. He's always doing all he can to come against you. And how do you do that? You stand firm in, in, the, in the Lord. So we are to stand, first of all, we are to stand faithfully. See, that's why you hear preachers all the time, that they, they, they talk to you about, uh, you need to be in church, you know, come to Sunday school, read the Bible, pray, because that helps you to be faithful, and you don't fall for things, you don't get off track when you stay consistent, when you stay faithful to the things of God. So you just stand faithfully, firm and faithfully in the Lord. But you're to stand firmly. That means that you are to be firmly rooted upon the Word of God. 
And it's the Word of God that should dictate everything in your life. It's got to be the Word of God so you don't fall for every wind of doctrine. We see people all the time that they say, well, they, they, well I don't know about this. I don't know. Now, listen, if you study the authentic Word of God, when falsehood comes along, you'll recognize it right off the bat. My understanding, now this is my understanding, that those that study counterfeit money, they don't study all the, the bad stuff. They study the authentic $20 bill or, or $100 bill. I'll give 20 because I don't see a whole lot of hundreds, so I'll do 20s. <laughs> but anyhow, that's another story. That's just a joke. This. But they will look at that $20 bill. They know it top and bottom, front and back. So when something is wrong comes along, they say, well, that's wrong. So you are to stand firmly on the Word of God. So when you listen to a preacher preach, you'll say, uh, that's not what it says. Uh, no, the Bible doesn't say that. So many times that we'll hear somebody preach or something, and we say, well, I don't know if that's in there or not. We ought to know. Most of us in this room have been Christians long enough that we ought to have an idea, a pretty good idea of what's in there and what's not in there. Amen? Amen. And then we ought to stand fearlessly, Meaning that we are to have courage that we don't bow down uh, to the things of this world. That we, when the enemy comes against us, no matter what happens, we are standing. Everybody look at me right here. Look over here, here. This is so important that you hear this. You need to stand fearlessly even when you are the only one. See, sometimes you will be the only one standing. I was, at a, I was at a church one time, and this, this guy came with me, and we was at a church, and in the church he came from, they clapped and shouted and all this other stuff. But we got to this church, and they didn't do that, and he, he, he didn't want to, and he always done it at his church. And, and I said, well, how come you don't clap for nothing here? He said, well, I'm not with my people. No, you got to be who you are in the Lord all the time. If I shout at that church, I'm going to shout at this church. If I say amen... I'm going to say amen. It doesn't matter where I'm at. It's who I belong to. Amen? That's right. So it talks about the manner in which you stand. But then it talks about the master in the standing. It says in the Lord. So he's not talking about standing for some earthly philosophy. He's not talking about standing for, for some earthly personality. He's telling you that you are to stand firm in the Lord. In the Lord Jesus Christ is where you stand. You stand in Him. Until we, you learn, until we learn, all of us learn, that is, Christ is our strength, that Christ is our security. If we don't learn that, then we will always have this tendency to, to fall back in defeat. We'll have that tendency to, to get discouraged. See, some of you come in today or listening online or, or have this issue that you're dealing with, that you have not standing firm in the Lord and you're falling back or you feel defeated, you feel discouraged. But as long as you know who's in charge, as long as you are standing firm in Jesus Christ, you can be an overcomer when you know that He is in control. No matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's in whatever house, it matters where you stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand firm in Him. Because He is our power. He is our protection. And listen to this. And we are, if you're a Christian, His possession. I belong to Him. Amen? Don't you? Amen. You belong to Him. So we see the manner and the master. But then there's something that comes about. So we saw the turn of the tide right there. But something was happening in the church. We see there in verse 2, we see a serenity challenge. He's challenging the church about this issue. And serenity is talking about being about peaceful peacefulness. It says in verse 2, it says, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So what we realize is that our, some of the biggest struggles or anxiety that we have in our life is when we are in a rocky relationship or have a rocky relationship with somebody we care about. And it's impossible to have peace when there's a rocky relationship happening, when there's contention in a relationship. 
because the whole situation is on your mind. Any of you that has ever had an argument with your spouse, had an argument with your best friend, realize that it's always on your mind and there's no peace there because you want it to be resolved. And here's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes, very sincere people who, who, who love the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they love his work, they love everything about him, sometimes they can disagree about an issue. But the thing is, is that we don't want to disagree unpleasantly. Because, see, everybody's got an opinion. It's all right to have a thought. It's all right to have an opinion. So Paul begins to, to, to address this struggle here between uh, Euodius and Syntyche. Because they don't, they're not of the same mind, it means they are, there's contention there. And Paul knows that this division that's taking place in the church is going to cause trouble there. Because, see, when a church has got division, you can't win souls. When the church has got division, uh, it's going uh, to bleed out into the congregation and cause, mo- it cause people to leave, people to be hurt. It, it's just a disaster. Unfortunately, th- this can happen. And a lack of unity is, is the greatest hindrance to a church being all that God uh, wants it to be. Uh, we, may not, we may not always agree on something, but we can agree to disagree. And I'm going to tell you what he gives you. I'm going to turn the tide here in just a minute. But think about this right here. Eodius and Syntyche. Their thing is lined up in one verse. You see what I'm saying? In one verse, it talks about them. What if your life was being wrote in one verse? What would it say? What would it be said about you in one verse? So what Paul does in this struggle, he turns the tide and tells what needs to happen. He says, he gives them a solution. He says, I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, when you say beseech, he is urging them. He, does, he, didn't, do, he didn't just come by and say, hey, y'all need to get y'all stuff together. He comes to him and says, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you that you get this situation resolved. And he knew the first thing when it says there, when it says, be of the same mind, that they be of the same mind in the Lord, he knew if they would take that to the Lord, take that struggle, that disagreement, that contention, whatever it was, it doesn't say what it is. If they would take that disagreement to the Lord together and pray about it, God would direct them to where they need to be. So here's the thing. You and I must come to the point to where we want what Jesus wants, not just what I want. It's got to be a Jesus thing, what Christ wants, and what's better for the kingdom of God, what's better for the church, and not what I think is the best. It's got to be us coming in agreement. God, I don't like this certain situation, but God, if you say that's right, and she's right or he's right or whatever, that's what we need to do. See, it's got to be bigger than you. That's why John the Baptist says he must increase and I must decrease. Because it's got to be about Jesus. And so Paul is addressing that. So Paul says we must commit to seeking. What he's saying is, you know, they've got to seek the Lord. And remember this right here. Remember this. Issues do not make quarrels. People do. Listen to me again. Issues don't make quarrels. People do. And when I'm doing marital counseling with people, I tell them when they come in my office, I say, listen, before you get married, you're going to have issues. And it's usually going to be the man's fault. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I couldn't help myself. Listen, you are going to have issues. You're going to have struggles. And the devil at times is going to try to bring you apart. He's going to try to separate you. He's going to try to tear you apart. Don't allow... The devil or an issue or a circumstance separate the person that you love from you. Don't let him 
put a, a wedge or cause trouble in something is the most important. This is the woman that I love, or this is the man I love. This is the one I would lay down my life for, we'd say. When we're doing those vows, man, it's all kinds of, you know, things that we say. And then all of a sudden, we have a little money issue, and we're all mad at one another. No, it's the issue that you come together to fight the issue together. Amen? And so, Paul is saying that you've got to have unity. And then coming into the last point here, there's a service challenge. Now, I want to break this verse down for you. And so, in order to turn the tide in a church, for that church to be what it needs to be, I'm going to come at this in two ways. I'm going to tell you, what, break it down for you. Let me read it to you, and then I will start to break it down. It says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with come in also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So he talks about here, when it talks about true yoke fellows and fellow laborers, he's talking about cooperation. And so he's talking about uh, being the people that can come together and work together. Because when you are yoked together, it's talking about when you have two animals, you or two ox or whatever, you put them in a yoke and they can pull together. If, long, if somebody's pulling in a, another direction, you cannot work together. And so he's talking about them being able, he's, he's a, alluding to or stressing, let me say it that way better, the fact that there needs to be cooperation. In order for this church or any church to turn the tide and be the church God wants it to be, there's got to be cooperation with the congregation and with leadership. And it's kind of it's hard and it's needed in the church. So he talks about that, but then he talks about the conduct. He talks about cooperation, he, and he says, then he talks about this. He said that, in the context, he said, labor with me in the gospel. So as he's talking to these people, he says they were uh, true yoke fellows. They were, they were fellow laborers. These ladies were fellow laborers, they, and he talks about several of them there. They were in cooperation. There's been an issue come up. But then he talks about conduct. He says, labor with me in the gospel. And I want to address that because, see, he said, labor with me in the gospel. That means that they, didn't, they weren't content to sit back and watch. They got involved in the church. They got involved in service. See, what he's saying is that you can't just sit back and be a spectator. You've got to be a player. You've got to get involved in the thing of church. It, 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 don't, don't come into a church and say, well, um, I don't like this, that, or whatever. We'll get involved and help make it better. Uh, I think the church needs a, 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 a drummer. Let me just say that. Well, if you play drums, don't just say they need one. Get involved. Dan said, I don't know if we need a drummer or not. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all understand what's being said here. There needs to be the conduct. You need to be... And see, here's the thing. God has uniquely gifted each and every one of you. Every, one, every Christian sitting here, God has blessed you with gifts and talents that he wants you to use to further the betterment of this church for his glory. And this church cannot be all that it could be, or the church that you attend cannot be all it could be if everybody sits back and just are spectating. And so Paul addresses that. But then he goes on and he gets to a part about, about a comfort. And look what he says here. He says, And I entreat thee also true yoke fellows. And that word true means genuine compared to count, counterfeit. So he says, you got to be true. And then he break in that yoke, yoke fellow means teammate. I mean, I meant together. He's talking about that. And so he's, what he's saying is there's a need for a true a true, genuine person to come in, if you're addressing it with these two ladies, that will come in and help them come back together and get over this disagreement. See, he didn't need somebody to, to come along and join the issue. He needed somebody to come along and help resolve the issue. They needed reconciliation. 
They needed the comfort of coming back together. See, God will use you to bring reconciliation, to bring peace, to bring comfort if you allow yourself. But if you join in to a fight and choose sides, guess what's going to happen? They're gonna be, there's going to be two armies that get raised up. And then they're going to be Bethel number two down the street. You understand? Or First Baptist number two. Whatever you want to say. See, he wants the resolve because that's how it's going to be the best for the church and for the kingdom. Because here's what happens. If, a, if it's a split of a church and there's just a bunch of other members go, that's not further in the kingdom. That's just swapping places. Isn't that right? That's right. And so he's talking to them about stopping the quarreling and there being comfort. And then the last thing is this, and, and I love this. I love it all, but listen to this. As he's talking to these Christian people, he's talking to the church. He says this. Let me read, go ahead and read. It says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, whose names are in the book of life. So he's talking to people that are redeemed, people that are, that are born again. Their names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, the book of life. And so they were secure in Christ. They know they're going to heaven. They have an eternal home in heaven. And that is, that is um, confident. And that, doesn't that make you feel? I mean, that's awesome, isn't it? It is. So these are those that have come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. These are ones that know that they're going to heaven, that they, their destiny, listen, their destiny, the, 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 this has happened, the tide had turned in their eternity. See, before they got saved, they were on their way to hell. But when they gave their life to Jesus, when they received what Jesus did for them at Calvary, when Christ died on the cross for them and shed his blood at Calvary, and when they received that free gift of salvation, guess what happened? It turned the tide of their destiny. And so we've talked about many issues today. But here's something I really want to say to you. Don't be concerned about having your, your, your name in the newspaper. Don't be concerned about having your name in a place of worldly honor. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being recognized. There's not. Nothing wrong with that. But you need to be more concerned that your name is written in the book of life. That's the most important, the most important place that your name needs to be written is in the book of life. Let Christ turn the tide of your destiny. Amen? Thank you.